Roger, Deborah Massa, Augusta Sulgum, Gucci, or Fad Slan, Augusta Valche. And Fogamini has shot Agin Gachblin, my control, Carla Augusta Kunov, a hort, the Daltigus Tishmahori Blin Shay, Major Leshen Lina Mach, then for him CAO. Corrigan Mutor Chor Garme, Osha Macrobin, and Kainsha a lawyer. August Mavi Main, all the pressure, a castal, Dalti, Tishmahori, Kavnori, Majalesh and Kaint, Bikinche, Gujanche, the Jagwal, Lin, Sinific, XCE at ownisagon.ie. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and boys, Tas Sulgum, and Gwich of Slanaga Savaj, that you're all keeping well and safe, and following um, the HSE protocol in relation to COVID. Um, every year we have um, an evening in relation to the CAO application. This evening um, has to be done obviously remotely, so uh, our Mutual Chor Garama, Mosh Makrobin, will present um, the, all the different um, areas that need to be fulfilled by pupils in order to fill out this form correctly and to ensure that they are registered. Um, as any pupil that isn't registered um, will not gain access to a place in third level. So it is very important both for parents and for students um, to realise how important this remote meeting will be. So after hearing this um, and if you have any difficulties with um, the signing or anything that has uh, cropped up during this meeting uh, or anything from the talk, by Moshe McRobin, please contact us at ce at onisagon.ie and we will uh, forward on and we'll ensure that uh, we'll try to answer any questions that will arise. Gurmila Magov, Tuka Giara, Agus Gijiga Bekvish and Rish, Slan Tham. Hello everybody. Normally at this point I would be saying good evening. We normally do this in the evening with sixth year parents, however, you may be watching this in the morning or in the afternoon, so hello everybody, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Brenda McRobin from Galoshstone. Now, Ivrahim, Tegan Shafain, Toshi the North School in Galoshstone, Vic Fimer through Van Regia, Augusta Tahi Ignatalti, Vic Ester Glumsa, Loud Law through Van Regia. Well, Ark, Tegan. Some parents may or may not be completely fluent in Irish. For the sake of clarity and to make sure everybody understands where we're going with this, by my gentleman, quit this more than Curry Law Show in Maryland. Doesn't mean I don't speak Irish, or I've forgotten the Irish while the schools have been closed down, but for, like I say, for the sake of clarity, to make sure everybody's on board, I'm going to talk, for the most part, in English. We're talking about the CEO application process. I'm not claiming that I know everything, or that I will, over the course of this talk, answer all possible questions. I will give a brief outline of how the system works, and based on the number of years experience here in Colostone, some of the pitfalls, some of the problems, some of the mistakes that tend to arise year after year. However, if you are not clear about anything, or if your son is not clear about anything, you do feel free to contact me or contact Colostone or contact somebody. We will help you through the process if there's some aspect of the process you don't understand. Sometime quite soon, hopefully, you or your son will sit down and look at the CEO form. Before, however, you look at the CEO form, and this is important to stress, there is no point in sitting down to fill out your CEO form with no research or no preparation or no planning done. Now, at this point of the year, the students have had many opportunities between open days, mostly virtual open days this year, so, the careers evening in Ehatur Garma, the college websites, prospectuses, booklets, brochures, whatever. At this point, I'm assuming that all students have made some effort to find out what kind of things are out there, what kind of things they might be interested in doing. However, before you fill out your CEO form, before you even open the CEO page, I would suggest you need to sit down and make a list of at least five or six courses. If you can have 10. You're allowed to fill out 10 boxes in terms of degree programs. If you've got 10, all the better. But don't sit down to fill out your CEO form with just one or two courses that you know about. 
find out about five, maybe six, if possible, seven or eight courses and see what you, do, what you need to know about the course. Now, when I say what you need to know, I'm going to give you a number of examples. I don't have time to go through every possible course in every college. So I'm going to just pick a few courses and look at the kind of thing you would think about researching. For example, let's imagine you're thinking of doing commerce in UCD. What you do in that case is you go onto the UCD website, you find the page that does commerce, and you find out a few things about the course. The first thing you should find out, for example, is what's called minimum requirements. Not everybody knows this, perhaps, but in order to do the commerce course in UCD, you need six subjects in your leaving cert. You must have English, Irish, a third language, and three other subjects. What that means is, for example, there are people who do the Leaving Cert without a modern language. If you don't have a modern language in your Leaving Cert and you haven't qualified for an exemption from the NUI for, for reasons I won't get into that now, there are people who, due to a particular learning difficulty with language, for example, dyslexia, not exclusively dyslexia, you may get an exemption. If you don't have an exemption though, and you don't have a modern language in your Leaving Cert, there is no point in you putting down commerce on your CEO application. You will not get a place on the course if you do not have the minimum entry requirements. That's not the same as points. Later on, we'll talk about points. But before you even talk about points for any course, there are entry requirements. Another example would be for leaving for commerce in UCT, there's a maths requirement. If you're doing ordinary level math, you need an O2, which means above 80%. If you're doing high level maths, you need a H6 above 40%. What that means is if you're doing ordinary level maths and you're struggling with maths and you hate maths and you don't think you're going to get more than about 50% in your leaving cert maths, you really have to ask yourself, am I wasting my time putting down UCD Commerce as one of my courses? They're looking for an O2 in maths. They're looking for over 80%. If you think that's realistic, fair enough, put it down. But if you think that's not going to happen, there is no way in the world I'm going to get above 80%, you need to ask yourself, should I be putting it down? After you look at the entry requirements, you then look at the course page. For example, I'm looking at here now at the UCD page. I'm not going to go into detail because not everyone has to know about this course. But on every course, there's a little blurb about why is this course for me, what kind of things, and also what will I study? what kind of modules are on the course. You should not put down a course simply because you like the title of the course, because it sounds like a great title. You go to the different modules. For example, in the first chair in commerce, you'll be doing accounting, management, economics, maths and statistics, business law, digital business, and quite a few other things. Maths and statistics, that sometimes surprises people. I thought it was a business course. Why are there maths on the course? You should not end up on any course in any college and be surprised when you walk in and find out these are the modules in first year. Every college, every website for every college will tell you, if you come on this course, these are the modules. This is what you will be doing. You don't put down the course on your CAO without having checked that out. And you'd look around a bit. So for example, if you're interested in doing commerce in UCD, you then look at, well, suppose I don't go to UCD. Do Trinity College, for example, have options? And you might look at, for example, and again, there are other options. There's a course called Business, Economic and Social Studies. You might have a look at that. You might look at their modules. You might look at their options. You might find it's not exactly the same. There are some similarities between doing Business, Economic and Social Studies in Trinity College and between doing Commerce in UCD, but they're not the same course. They don't have the same modules. You may find, for whatever reason, you prefer this course rather than that course. You may then find, for example, the TUD, Technological University Dublin, formerly the DIT, they have a course called Business and Management. Again, very similar in many ways to Commerce, but not the same, not exactly the same. It might be worthwhile checking out that course. What do they do? What are their modules? What are their entry requirements? So for example, if you look at the minimum entry requirements for the business and management course in TUD, you'll find that you can get into that course with an 04 in maths as opposed to an 02. That is to say, above 60% on your ordinary level paper rather than above 80%. For some people, that 
is a vitally important piece of information. You may not get the O2 in maths, but you may find that you're okay to get an O4, in which case you should be looking at at least putting down business management. If you think you might get the O2 in maths and you really would prefer to go to UCD, yes, you can put down UCD Commerce, but you should put down the other course the other courses you're interested in somewhere on your list, not necessarily box number one, but you should put them down. So like I say, before you start on the CEO, before you even open the CEO page to begin the registration process, go to a list of courses, go to a list of possibilities. Have at least five or six courses that could work for you, that you're interested in, that the modules look like they might maybe be suitable for you, and that you have checked out the entry requirements and that you're okay. For most Leaving Cert students, you'll be talking about six subjects that will be looked at as terms of entry requirements. It's true the students at Stone will be doing seven subjects. Some people, particularly the people doing applied maths, may be doing eight subjects. But in terms of entry requirements, six subjects is what you'll be looking at. Most colleges, there are very few exceptions to this, require you to have English in your Leaving Cert. In other words, if you don't get a pass in Leaving Cert English, there are very few options for you. Not all colleges require Irish as an entry requirement. Not all colleges, and certainly quite a lot of colleges, don't require maths necessarily for an entry requirement for all of their courses. It depends on the course. But it varies. It varies from college to college, and it varies within colleges from course to course. You need to know what it is that you're applying for and what the entry requirements are. So if we assume you've put together a list of five or six, like I say, no harm if you have seven or eight courses, you now have a list of the courses. Each course has what's called a course code. So for example, if I'm applying for the business and management course in TUD, the course code for that is TU903. You make a note of that. And then you go back and you look at your what's called BEST, the Business, Economic and Social Studies course in Trinity. You ask yourself, do I know the course code? TR081, that's the course code. That's the, what you use to apply for that course. Your Commerce UCD course, again, I'm not expecting anybody to know this information off by heart. You go on the website or on the prospectus, DN650, is the course code for Commerce UCD. So you make a list. These are the courses I'm interested in. And these are the course codes. I've checked out what's on the course. What are the modules? I've checked out the entry requirements. I have some idea now that these are the courses I'm interested in. At that point, you're ready to go on your CEO website. So I will talk you through a little bit what comes up on the CEO. The first point is there is a small fee to pay. It's not hugely expensive, it costs 45 euros, but there's a reduced fee if you apply to the CEO by the 20th of January, you get a slight reduction on the fee. So it will be no harm for you to realize that it's a good idea, if you can, to apply by the 20th of January. If you can't apply for the 20th of January, by any means, make sure at the very least that you do apply by the 1st of February. After the 1st of February, if you're not registered in the CEO, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very difficult to get, get into the race and there are restrictions of what you can do. So everybody really needs to know that they're at least on the system or registered on the system by the 1st of February. But like I say, if you can do it by the 20th of January, all the better. It may sound obvious. The first thing you're asked to do is your surname, your forename, your title as in Mr, Miss, Mrs, Miss, etc. <coughs> your date of birth. Believe it or not, this requires a little bit of clarification. What they say on the CEO website is the following. You should enter your name and date of birth as it appears on your birth certificate or passport. If you wish to apply under a different name, the Higher Education Institute will require proof of identification or registration. Now, that, believe it or not, can cause difficulties. Let's imagine your name on your birth certificate says Alexander Murphy and you're known to your friends and to your family and to your cousins and etc as Alex Murphy. 
chances are in Colostion you regard it Alastair or Morocco. Which name do you put down? It says here on the CEO website you should put down the name that's on your birth cert or your passport. Believe it or not, there's an argument for not doing that. And the reason for that is very simple. Later on, you haven't got to this point yet, but later on, at some point, the CEO will be contacted at school to look for the Leaving Cert exam numbers of the people who are doing the Leaving Cert in Colostone. If your name on the school register is Alistair or Morocco, and if you're going to be registered for the Leaving Cert exam under the name Alistair or Morocco, in my opinion, it might be simpler to register for the CEO using the same name. If you are registered for the state exams at Alistair or Morocco, and you write down Alex Murphy on your CEO, it's not a huge problem. But it does mean the CEO at some point will contact you and they will say, you register for the CEO, but for some reason we don't have your exam number, could you send it to us? Now that sounds very simple. It has caused difficulties in the past. Some students, for whatever reason, use an email address when they're applying to the CEO that they don't use very often. I had a student last August who came running to me in a panic three days before the leaving sort of results were due out. And he said, I just realized the CEO sent me an email in April and for some reason it went into either went in somewhere or he didn't use the email address very often, but he had not looked at his email. The subject of the email was very simple. We don't have your leaving cert number. Could you tell us what it is? That sounds like a very simple thing to do. But like I say, for whatever reason, this student did not see this e email until well into August. That was difficult. We did manage through a long series of phone calls and appeals and things, we did manage to sort it out. But he did two things wrong, in my opinion. Had he registered for the CAO using the name that he had on his school register, the name that he was using for the Leaving Cert exam, it wouldn't have been necessary for the CEO to send that email. And the second thing he did wrong was, if you're going to write down an email address on your CEO application, you make sure that is the email address that you will be using. Use a current or live email address. So, like I say, it sounds simple, but you put down your surname and your forename, put it down. In my opinion, it would be better to put down the one you use in school, your date of birth, your home address. I'm assuming everybody will get that correct. No harm to know your postal code or your air code if you have better. If you can have it, it's not doesn't take that much thing. Email address, like I say, please put down an email address that you use regularly. It should not happen that you get an email from the CEO sometime in April or May and you don't see it until August or September. Whatever email address you put down, you make sure that is the email address that somebody, not necessarily you, but that somebody will see it. If an email arrives from the CEO, you need to know that you or your parent or somebody you can rely on will see that email and will be in a position to deal with it. You're asked for a phone number. <clears throat> Normally people put on their mobile phone number. You have the option, and I really have no recommendation on this one. Do you wish to receive SMS text messages from the CEO? It's up to you. You can put yes or no on that. And do you wish to receive text messages from the HEI? Again, you may not know this abbreviation, the Higher Education Institute. Do you wish to receive text messages from the HEIs you applied to? So for example, if you put down IADT Dunleary, UCD, Trinity College, and the TUD in your application, are you willing to accept text messages from them? It's entirely up to you. I have no particular recommendation on that. Country of birth and nationality, for most people, that will be Ireland. But not for everybody. Again, it's straightforward enough. You're asked to put in what exam you have doing. Now, there's a whole list of exams there. For most people, and particularly for people who are in sixth year in school, it's very simple. You put a tick in the first box, Irish Leaving Cert exam. You may not know this, but people who, for example, 
who are living in England or in France or in Germany who have GCEs or A-levels or baccalaureate or whatever, those people are entitled to apply to the CEO just as much as people in Ireland. So CEO has a whole list of other qualifications you may have. Like I say, you don't need to worry about all those other things. You're not a mature student. You didn't do the leaving so 20 years ago. You don't have a GCE or GCSE. You put a tick in the first box, you're a current leaving sort of student. At the moment, students, I'm talking now in January, students don't yet have their examination number for the leaving cert. That's okay, we will deal with that later. The CEO will get that information later. Like I say, if your name is in Irish, applying for the leaving cert, and you use your English name, they may have to contact you to get it. But at the time you're applying for the CEO, in January, you don't need your Leaving Cert exam number. I'm talking now to people who are doing the Leaving Cert this year primarily. Some people may be applying to the CEO this year on the basis of last year's Leaving Cert or the Leaving Cert of the year before last. In that case, fair enough, they do have a number and they may, be, they may be required to give that. For a person who's doing the Leaving Cert this year, it's quite straightforward. You apply to the CEO, but you do not need your Leaving Cert exam number as yet. You're then asked to pay the fee. <clears throat> Most people pay this by credit or debit card. It may not necessarily be your credit card, but obviously if it's a parent's credit card, again, you know, you know the procedures about using somebody else's card online and the precautions. I'm not getting into all that. I'm sure the person who gives you the credit card or the debit card will want that credit card back as soon as you've finished with it and will ask you not to go on iTunes or wherever else and do all kinds of things with the card when you're doing it. So that's the first part of the thing. You, you fill out your details. Like I say, it's straightforward enough, but people do make mistakes. We then come on to the second page of the CEO form, which is where you choose your courses. I would seriously suggest when you are sitting down to choose your CEO courses, you make sure that you have the television switched off, your phone switched off, and that you're going to do this properly. There is no point in being distracted or diverted or in any way careless while you're filling out your CAO form. You take this seriously, you sit down, you ask yourself, what are the courses I want? Let us imagine, I used examples already of business studies and of business management and of Bachelor of Economic Social Studies on Commerce UCT. Let's imagine, and like I say, I know this doesn't apply to everybody. I don't have time to go through all the possibilities. Let's imagine you're looking at those courses. Which of those courses would you most like to get? Which of those courses would you regard as your first choice, as the ideal? That is the course you put down in the first box on the top of the list. This, believe it or not, sounds simple to say, but people get this wrong. Whatever course you want to do next year, whatever is your ideal, whatever course you think is most suitable for you, that is your first choice. It doesn't matter how many points were required for that course as opposed to the other courses. And the reason I have to put a huge emphasis on this is the following. This sounds simple, but it causes complications. In August, after the Leaving Cert results, the CAO computer will look at your courses. The CAO computer will start at the top of your list with your first choice. If you have enough points, and if you have the correct interior requirements in terms of a modern language or science subject or correct grade in maths or whatever, the CAO computer will send you an offer for your first choice. The CEO computer in those circumstances will not even bother to look at what your second or your third or fourth choice was. In other words, if you have the entry requirements and the points for your number one choice, you get your number one choice. There is no point at that point in August, you saying, but I would rather my second choice or I would rather my third choice. The logic of the CEO is you were given a list you said this was your first choice and we believed you. And there is no point now telling us you'd rather something else. Just to clarify this, you applied to the CEO 
like I said, if possible by the 20th of January, by certainly by the 1st of February. The CEO system closes temporarily after the 1st of February, but it opens again in May until the 1st of July for what's called the change of mind. You can change your mind, and you can change your mind more than once, twice, even three times, there's no limit, up until the 1st of July. So if, for example, you put business, economics, and social studies in Trinity College as your first choice, and you put Commerce and UCD as your second choice, and that's what went to the CEO before the 1st of February, sometime in May or in June, or even, like I say, up to the 1st of July, you can change that. Should you find out something, should you find some relevant piece of information about, about the course or about the college, you, put, you have until the 1st of July to change your mind. But it is assumed on the 1st of July that you've thought about this and that you've made up your mind and that you've now clarified in your head, this is my first choice. Why would you choose a particular course rather than another course? Well, like I say, there are lots of factors. It may be that the college is more convenient to you in terms of public transport or in terms of where you live. That is relevant. It may be that the modules in that course are more appealing to you that you've looked through the list of modules on the different courses and you think this particular course seems to have more of the things I'm interested in than that other course, that's fine. It may also be to do with facilities in college. Different people have different preferences and different interests. We had students here not, not very long ago and even though this might not have mattered to a lot of other people, cricket was very important to them and playing cricket and they want to go to the college that has the best facilities in terms of cricket. There's a student we had here last year who played chess at a very high level, was on the Irish team for chess. When he was looking at the different colleges, it mattered to him. Like I say, it may not have mattered to anybody else in Stevens this year. It mattered to this particular student that there was a chess club in the college and that they were, you know, able to, that he would be able to play at a reasonably high competitive level. There are different reasons why different people might choose one course rather than another. It may be, like I say, to do with the course itself. It may be due to the location of the college or facilities in the college. And it may be for another reason that's particular to you. But you should check these things out. Before you put down a course, you should know something about the college, what kind of college it is, what kind of numbers they have, what kind of things they do, what kind of clubs, how easy is it for you to get to the college. A few years ago, for example, I had a student who lived in Stepaside. Nothing against Stepaside, but he came to me and he was showing me that he had a course on DCU to put down on the CEO list. And I thought to myself, well, let's just clarify. If you have a lecture in DCU early in the morning at 9 a.m., how exactly are you going to get from step aside to DCU? He hadn't thought of that. He said, oh, I'll figure it out maybe when I get there. I thought, no, let's figure it out now. Let's look at the options. Let's... Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying it can't be done. But if you're going to put down a course in DCU, in Glasnevin, on your list, you do need to ask yourself that question. Will I be able to get to DCU if I have a nine o'clock lecture? And how will that work out and how do I go there? You shouldn't be putting down colleges and courses without thinking through what are the implications? What kind of things are required? What kind of modules are there? What kind of college is this? Again, I had a parent talk to me a few years ago. Apparently, his son was very surprised. <clears throat> he went to the IADT in Dunleary. He had never set foot on the IADT campus prior to being registered as a student. He was surprised there was a much smaller campus than UCD and that there weren't as many students and that there weren't people doing things like medicine and engineering and all kinds of things. That should not have been a surprise. If I have nothing against IADT in Dunleary, all I'm saying is, it's a different college in terms of size, in terms of how it works, in terms of the dynamic than the larger colleges such as UCD. For some people, that may be an advantage. For other people, it may be a disadvantage. But you should know. And for a student in Colossus Joan not to have done that level of research, you can go out the front gate of Colossus Joan, you can get on the 46A, and you can be on the campus of IADT within about 35 minutes. If you're going to put down a course in IADT, at least do that once or twice. Have some idea what kind of campus, what kind of college, what kind of facilities, what kind of place you're going to.
It may appeal to you, it may not appeal to you, but you should know, you should have some idea, what kind of place am I applying to? What kind of place is this? What kind of students are there? What kind of clubs? Do they have this club, that club, this, and that? You know, all of these things matter. <clears throat> we'll come back to the form. <clears throat> As you said, the course that most appeals to you, that's your first choice. It shouldn't be based on the number of points. It should be based on what it is you do. And I can say, tell you in complete sincerity that that's not theoretical, that's very practical. I have a daughter who's now 21. She did a Leaving Stone Colossus she's gone not that long ago. It was in her very nature to be doing literature and languages and things like that. She's now doing a course called English, Drama and Film. For her, that is the right course. It doesn't matter that she might have had more points in her Leaving Stone than were actually required for that course. It would make no sense for me or for anybody else to tell her, hey, you've got points. You could do medicine or engineering or actuarial financial studies with the points you have. Why would you go and do something like English and film? If that's what your interests are in, that's what your interests are in, and that's the right course for you. You should not be railroaded into a high points course just because you think you might get high points. Regrettably, in Ireland, in many of the colleges, there are people who start on a course who realise within about five or six weeks, I'm in the wrong place. I didn't check this out. I didn't know it was going to be like this. This isn't right for me. That can be a very inconvenient and indeed costly mistake. <clears throat> so what I would say is, you do need to know in advance what are the courses. <clears throat> Let us then say, go back to our example of business studies. Let's say you have put commerce and UCD as your first choice. What do you do then? Well, assuming, like I say, that is genuinely your first preference, fair enough, that's your first choice. You then ask yourself, suppose I don't get the points, or suppose I don't get the O2 in maths. Suppose for whatever reason, it isn't possible for me to get the place in commerce UCD. At that point, you say, well, what's my second choice? If I don't get common university, what else would I like? What other courses could be? And that, after a little bit of thinking, you put a similar course in your second choice. <clears throat> if in August, when the leaving results come out, like I say, the CEO computer is very logical and methodical. It starts at the top of the list. It starts with your number one choice. If you have enough points and the entry requirements are your number one choice, you get it. If you don't have the points or you don't have a required subject, all that happens is the computer then moves down to box number two and asks the same series of questions. Does this person have six legal sort of subjects? Does he have the subject requirements of this course? And does he have the points? And if yes is the answer to those questions, you are sent out an offer for that course. If there's a problem, for example, you don't have enough points or you don't have a subject that's required. All that happens is the computer moves on to box number three. The computer will carry on down the list. Hopefully at some point, a course will, it may be your fifth choice, it may be your sixth choice. It tends not to be, but you should have filled up enough boxes so that you will get a choice. This, however, is where you need to be careful. <clears throat> It can happen, and regrettably, it does happen. Suppose you put down 10 courses on your CAO, all of which required last year more than, let's say, 480 points. In other words, you've put down 10 courses, all of which have high points. And for whatever reason, you get a slightly disappointing leaving cert. You only get 450 points. Now, let me just say, 450 points is a very good leaving cert. It is well above the national average. It should not happen that a person is left without a CEO offer having got 450 points. That really should not happen. Unfortunately, it does happen. And the reason it happens is very simple. If you put down all courses, all 10 courses that require high points, 
you are putting yourself in that position where you could end up with a quite a good leaving search. Like I say, a leaving search that's well above the national average, but because you put down only those courses, you are left with no offer. The CEO computer starts at the top, goes to box number two, goes to box number three, goes to box number four, finds that even for box number 10, the points requirements were above what you actually got in your leaving search. <clears throat> it can be very frustrating to talk to a student who has got a good leaving search but hasn't got an offer. Like I say, this should not happen, but regrettably it does happen. <clears throat> it can be equally frustrating for that student to meet another student in his class who only got 320 points in his leaving search, but is delighted because guess what? He got the course he wanted. I'm going to tell you this now. When you're filling out your CEO form, you should make sure that when you get further down the list, down towards box number nine and box number 10, at that point, you need to ask yourself, what if? What if something happens? Things do happen. People get sick. A parent may be ill. There may be, like I say, you may be out messing about with your friends two days before the leaving cert exam and a slitter hits you in the head and you've got bad concussion for the first two or three days of the leaving cert. You may break a leg or break an arm. You may have difficult family circumstances. There may be a death in the family. There are all kinds of reasons. You cannot assume that you will get a good leaving cert just because you think at this point that you will. It's reckoned that about 1% of leaving cert students go through some kind of crisis or something that prevents them getting the leaving cert they think they deserve. Up to recently, there was no provision made for this. There has been some provision made in recent years. However, given the way that things are this year, I wouldn't assume anything. What I'm saying is, when you get to box number nine and box number 10, at that point, ask yourself, what if I'm interested in doing a subject in the business area? What if I don't get the leaving cert I think I'm going to get? What if I only have 320 points? Even though at the moment I'm expecting to get more than 500 or close to 500, at that point you use what I call your safety net. You find a course that has a reasonable number of points, that is attainable, that even with the poor leaving cert or difficult circumstances that you will get. Yes, on your first, second, third or fourth choice, be ambitious. Even if you don't think you're going to get 500 points. For example, the points for commerce and UCD, the example we gave already, are quite high. You do need to get a good leaving cert. You do need to be realistically talking about 500-ish points. Just in case we don't know this, the points will vary from year to year. I cannot at this point tell you exactly what the points will be for Commerce and UCD on this year or for any other course in any other college. However, the chances are, if the course consistently required in around 500 points in previous years, it's unlikely to drop. Nevertheless, even if you think you'll probably only get about 450 points, for your first and second and third choice on your CEO, be ambitious. Think positively. Ask yourself, what would I really like to do? What if all goes well and I do get a better leaving source than my results so far would indicate? That's where you can do it. You put down the course you really want. You put down the course that you would be delighted to get. And you do that for at least the first three or four choices. But you look around after that and think, okay, that's great. If I get those points, that's great. That's wonderful. I'll be delighted. What happens if I don't get the 500 points? What happens if I only have about 450 points? Make sure somewhere on your list, not necessarily in the first three or four choices, but make sure somewhere on your list you've got the safety net. <clears throat> There's one other thing that's worth mentioning. So far I've talked about entry requirements and about points. There are some courses, and they're described in the CEO handbook as restricted entry. A restricted entry course means it isn't just about your leaving cert results or points. It tends to occur most often in courses in the area of art and film and music and things like this. In other words, we need something other than your leaving cert. 
if you're applying for your art course, for example, they want to see a portfolio. They want some indication that you have some kind of artistic ability, that you're suitable to go and do a course in art. If you're applying for a music course, it doesn't make sense to say, we're letting this person in to do a degree in music because, hey, look at the points he has. You may have high points because you've got a H1 in physics and chemistry and applied maths and maths. Now, fair enough, that's a good result. Well done to you. But it doesn't necessarily mean you're a suitable candidate for a degree course in music. So for a course in music, or for a course in drama, or for a course in art, or for quite a few other courses, these are what's called restricted entry courses. There is more than an even such required. It means there's an interview, or an audition, or a portfolio, or a music test. There is something other than your standard leaving sort of results. Those courses on the CEO handbook have a little asterisk and it says restricted. If you are thinking, or even if you're only half thinking of doing one of those courses, you apply for it by the 1st of February. You cannot apply for that course using the change of mind in May or June or, June or up to the 1st of July. <clears throat> the reason is very simple. They will be doing the auditions or looking at the portfolios or holding the music tests sometime in March or April. So you can't have a person suddenly putting down a music or an art course on his change of mind form sometime in June because you're no longer eligible, you won't be called to do the music test because it has already happened. From your point of view, there are certain implications here. Like I say, if you think you might be interested in doing one of those courses, you make sure it's on your form by the 1st of February. If you change your mind and decide that you don't actually want to do that course, that's no problem. When the change of mind opens, you can get rid of that course. Or, for example, if that course was your number two choice, you can move down to be your number five choice. Or indeed move up to be your number one choice. But what you cannot do <coughs> with the restricted entry course, you cannot suddenly apply for it after the 1st of February. <coughs> In recent years, medicine has become one of those courses. Because, as many of you may know, there's a thing called a HPAT exam. And like I say, any, for any course in which there's something other than purely leaving sort of results, the course is restricted. If you're thinking you might be doing it, you apply by the 1st of February. But the other thing you need to do is this. Suppose you don't understand why it's a restricted course. Well then, if you're going to apply for it, you need to clarify that. And it's not enough to know that there's a portfolio or there's a music exam. You need much more detail than that. You need to find out when they say a portfolio, what do they mean? How many pieces of work are they expecting? What kind of work? Are there any guidelines available on the website telling me for, for your portfolio, for this particular course, this is what we're looking for. All of the colleges are quite open and have information and sometimes information days and information evenings about portfolios. But if you're applying for a restricted entry course, you need to know. So for example, if you know there's a music test, what does that mean, a music test? Am I required to go and play one piece of music or are they looking for two or three pieces? If there's an audition, you can do a drama course. Is it okay if I come with three pieces from Shakespeare? Or will they expect one piece from Shakespeare, one piece maybe from a modern American play, and one piece from a modern Irish play? I'm not saying I'm gonna answer those questions here now, but those are the kind of things you need to investigate. If a course is restricted, what exactly are the requirements? What extra is there above and beyond leaving sort of results and leaving sort of points? So like I say, you apply for that course. If you think you might want to do that course, you apply for the course by the 1st of February. If you change your mind, you can delete it from your list or you can move it around, change it from, from being number two or number three to being number one or to being number seven or number eight. The key thing is, by the 1st of February, and like I say, if possible by the 20th of January, have your CAO in. Make sure you're in the system, make sure you're registered, make sure you've thought carefully about your courses. And if you need more help, if you need more information, if something is not clear to you, if there are some things about some course or some things about the application process, 
talk to us. I will be here, Master Gurra will be here, the school will be available. If there is something that you do not understand about the CEO process, we will help you. We, we have lots of experience in this. We have been doing this for a long time. I've been working in Glossstone and guidance, believe it or not, since 1998. I've talked to a lot of students over those years. I know a fair bit. I'm not saying I'm a genius. I'm not saying I'm smarter than you. What we do have is experience. We know how this works. We know what pitfalls there are. We know what mistakes people tend to make, and we will help you avoid those mistakes. But you have to do a little bit of the work. You have to research your courses, and you have to apply to the CAO, and like I say, get it right. Choose a password. As well as your email address, you're required to choose a password. It's very frustrating when a student comes up to my room, I have a guidance room, I've had students in there, sitting there, they want to talk to me about their CEO, I say okay, sit there at the computer, open your CEO account for me, oh I can't remember my password, can I call my mother? And I'm asking them, why would you need to call your mother? Well you see, it was actually my mother who opened my CEO account, she was getting worried I wasn't going to do one, so she opened the CEO account for me and she chose the password, I don't know what she chose. I am not joking you, this has happened. You need, like I say, to put your name, put your email address, one that you will use, and choose a password that you know and that you will remember. There is no point coming to me saying, I've lost or I've lost or I've forgotten my CEO password. Can you help me? I can't. I can no more help you in that situation than, for example, if you told me you'd forgotten your password for Facebook or for whatever, Snapchat, Instagram, I have nothing to do with that. If you, for some reason, forget your CEO password, <clears throat> you'll have to get in contact with the CEO yourself and solve that problem. It is assumed, <clears throat> rightly or wrongly, it is assumed when you're applying to the CEO that you are a mature adult and that this is your application. So it should be you, not your mother, not your father, not me, who chooses your courses and who chooses your password. This is your application and you get it right. At this point, I'm going to stop. At this point, like I say, I've said all I think I need to say. If there's more that you need to know, come talk to us and we will, we will help you in any way we can. So best of luck to everybody. That's it. Marshall McRobbing.